Bibles this morning to the book of Judges. In the Old Testament, the book of Judges, chapter 16. The book of Judges, chapter 16, my message is entitled, His Hair Grew Back Again. Now, beloved, there's some profound lessons we can learn in this story, in this tryst between Samson and Delilah. And I think I can point some out to you today, and we can apply them to our lives, and we can grow as Christians. Amen? His hair grew back again. Judges chapter 16. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's word. Beginning with verse number 15. It says, And she, Delilah, said unto him, Samson, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times. She was trying to get some information out of Samson, where his, where his great strength came from. And Samson at this point was just fooling around with her, wouldn't tell her. And that's not told me where thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. In other words, he was sick of her persistent nagging. <laughs> that's what he's saying. That he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, and they hid in her, her bedroom. This once, for he had shown me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up and brought unto her money in her hand. They gave her 30 pieces of silver, almost a ton of silver they gave her. She made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. He had seven braids of hair on his head. And she, uh, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Remember, she would wake him up before and say, uh, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are here. And she'd tie his hair to a, a whatever it was, a, a spinning wheel. He'd get up and yank it right off the ground because the Spirit of God was upon him. And so, verse 20, she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit, praise the Lord, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. In other words, they not only cut off his braids, they shaved his head just to make sure that the Spirit of God wasn't upon him anymore. Amen. Our Father and our God, we praise you. Lord, as we look at the lessons that you give us in the Old Testament, you tell us these things are written for our example, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. Father, I pray you'd have the church triumphant in heaven praying for us today, praying for this preacher. Give me strength. Give me anointing, Lord God. Minister uh, uh, grace to your people so they can understand the truths. And Lord, we can apply them to our lives so we can be better Christians and glorified our blessed Savior and hopefully our soon coming King. For We ask in his name, amen, and you may be seated. If you've read the book of Judges, you will see that it covers about 375 to 400 years. Because Israel had now turned their back on God, and over and over again this phrase is used, this refrain, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. You see that seven times throughout the book of Judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes instead of obeying God. And so God allowed the surrounding pagan nations, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Philistines, and others to now attack and oppress Israel. Why? Because he wanted to get them to repent and return back unto him, the God of Israel. And yet in the midst of their subrogation to these heathens, beloved, even though God had sent them, when they cried out to God, when they called out to God for help, he still mercifully sent them a judge. Hence, we get the word judges. Now, who was a judge? A judge in Israel was a warrior. He was a deliverer. God would send him to lead the armies of Israel to fight against these oppressing nations and deliver them. In other words, he was a man of God to deliver them from their enemies that God would appoint. You see, God can work through all kinds of people, can he? And when God works through you, beloved, what ordinary now becomes extraordinary. Would you say amen? So during this unruly and defiant time, God had sent 
15 such judges to deliver them, one of which was named Shim Shon. Shim Shon. What's that? Shim Shon is Hebrew for Samson. The word Samson means the, uh, uh, like the sunlight. But God had appointed him to bring the moral, spiritual light of God's truth, the truth of his word, back to Israel. But I mean, it's amazing how easy it is for people to depart like sheep from the God of Israel, to depart from the word. And that's why we owe a debt. And I'm not saying because I'm a pastor. All these men of God that have stood for years and years and years as a constant in this world of variableness and brought us back to the Word of God, and kept it alive. Would you say amen out there? But beloved, Samson was an anomaly. He was an abnormality. What do you mean, preacher? I'm saying as a man of God, because he shined more moral and spiritual darkness in his life than he ever did uh, the light that he was supposed to shine. And yet, in spite of all that, God still powerfully used him to get done what God wanted done. Amen? So, beloved, he wasn't anything like a true man of God. He wasn't anything like a real judge sent to deliver God's rebellious people, but God used them. Even though he was rebellious, he was as rebellious as they were, as you read. In fact, even more so as you read this book. You see, Scripture reveals that Samson was a rebel and he was a nonconformist. Most people don't like to take uh, uh, orders from anyone. I don't. Do you? That was one of the hardest things I had learned in the Marine Corps until they knocked me upside the head. In them days, they could put gloves on and beat you. And so you learn quick. If you don't want your mouth like this and your head like that and your ears cauliflowered, you obeyed what the DI said. Amen? But Samson, beloved, was a real rabble riser. We would call him a hell raiser today. And as you study his life, that's what he did. He did what he pleased. Imagine being uh, endowed with all that strength to do it. Nobody could stand in his path. You see, beloved, he loved to both party and drink with pagan women. And he regularly disobeyed and lived contrary to God's word, will, and ways for his life. Still, God used him to deliver Israel from the Philistines. But, beloved, he never fully did it because of his sins and because of his untimely death, because of his sins. And so we read the book, we find that Samson ended up judging Israel, delivering Israel for the next 20 years. He kept them safe from the Philistines until he died. Now, as you read the book of Judges, you'll see that everything about Samson was supernatural. His birth was supernatural. His Herculean strength was supernatural. His life, his death was supernatural. Indeed, we're introduced to the angel of the Lord that appeared uh, to his aged and childless parents and told them that indeed they were going to have a son in their old age. The angel just appeared before Manoah, beloved. And they, God, that angel said, I want that child to be a Nazarite. Now, Jesus was not a Nazarite. He was from Nazareth. He says, I want that child to be a Nazarite. Now, what is a Nazarite? A Nazarite in them days, if you were to read Numbers chapter 6, was someone who took a vow to be totally separated, dedicated, and consecrated to God. And he was to be a judge, a deliverer in Israel. Number 6 reveals that a Nazarite vow consisted of three strict rules that they had to adhere to for the duration of that vow or for the rest of their life. Some people took a Nazarite vow for a year, some for 10 years, some for all of their years, all of their life. But if you took that vow, you had to adhere to three strict rules before God. Now, I want you to uh, uh, remember this, beloved. We forget God sometimes in our daily life, and we're filled with the Holy Ghost. And it's easy to do. Now, can you imagine being a Nazarite? Every day you have to remember those strict rules because God is watching. God is with you. Would you say amen out there? But, beloved... See, Samson never really took that vow himself. His parents did. His parents bound him to that vow. But of course, as we read the scriptures, we see that as Samson got older, he grew up, beloved. Ultimately, he consented uh, that he would keep the vow. But the fact of the matter was, he lied to himself and he lied lied to God because he never fully kept it. You see, the angel of the Lord told his parents that the strict rules of a Nazarite vow 
from the womb to the tomb, or the duration of that vow, was this. Number one, Samson was not to drink any fermented wine or strong drink. Fermented wine and strong drink typified sin in a person's life. He couldn't eat raisins. He couldn't eat dates. Anything dried up like that. Number two, Samson was not to eat any unclean and fermented foods or to touch the dead corpse of a person or an animal. Of course, he violated that. And number three, a Nazarite was never ever to cut their hair. The angel of the Lord specifically told his parents, and these are the words, quote, no razor shall come on his head, unquote. Never will he cut his hair. Never will he shave his head. Would you say amen out there? Now, every man in Israel at that time wore short hair. We see pictures of Jesus with long hair, but beloved, that's man's imagination. The Jews knew for a man to have long hair was to be like a woman, so they always kept their hair short. Indeed, as you study history, if you read Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, you see that even the Romans kept short hair, and they called the barbarians who wore long hair that very thing. They were barbarians for doing that. They had no hygiene. And so if you took a Nazarite vow, beloved, you were pointing out to everyone that you were a man of God and you now belonged to God. Now, Samson had these seven long braids, like dreadlocks almost. They were kind of braided. Now, you can just imagine him walking around, everybody else, and here's Samson walking around with these long braids and long hair. And so everybody knew as they looked at him that this was God's deliverer. This was God's man. This was God's judge. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, but as Samson grew up into a man, then we found out he did not become bound by any rules, God or man's rules. Indeed, he broke all the three rules of his Nazarite vow and then some. And yet, despite his sins, God still mightily used him, beloved, but it was at the high price of the cost of his eyes and ultimately of his life. Sin costs, don't you forget that. Now, there's three truths we need to examine here about Samson. I hope they will also help us. Number one, beloved, Samson's rebellion. Samson's rebellion. I want you to look at verses 15 through 17 and drop down to verse 20 again. And she, Delilah, said unto him, Samson, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head. Now, Samson was probably in his 30s at this time because he had to be 30 years of age to start a minister, be a minister for God. That's why we see John the Baptist. He was what? 30 years of age when he started. <clears throat> started. How old was Jesus? 30 years of age when he started. So you imagine this kid is 30 years of age or older, probably in his 40s. We don't know. He says, no razor has come upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Drop down to verse 20. And she, Delilah, said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out, as at other times before, and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Now, beloved, Samson was not some big, huge muscle man. I've taught you before. Samson was not some mighty Hercules. Samson was not some alien being, some alien Superman that just dropped down from space somewhere. Now, I know many folks see him as this big, strong man. They see him as this big, strong character like this, beloved, but he wasn't. Samson, according to Scripture, was a medium-sized man. He was a man of average build. And yet this ordinary-looking guy possessed extraordinary and superhuman strength. You see, that's what so puzzled and mystified all of his enemies. These men were warriors. Goliath was over nine feet, almost ten feet tall. And here's this little guy able to pick things up, kill lions with his bare hands. Who are you? Where'd you get that? Where did he get this strength? It was unbelievable, beloved, what things he could do, especially as you read the book. Amen? You know, uh, his astonishing strength, though, 
Samson revealed did not come from him. He was not born with this. This strength came from without him. It was outside of him. It was the God of Israel, the God of the universe, who would come upon him, and his spirit would empower him. You know, of Samson, it is said more in the scriptures than any other person in the Bible that the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And that's where he got his strength and his power. Beloved, it said that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, but it doesn't say he did as much as he did upon Samson. It is said in the Scriptures that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David and the prophets Elijah and the prophet Elisha, but never does it say as often as it does that the Spirit of the Lord came upon them like it did with Samson. Would you say amen out there? Hey, listen to me now. Elijah was a righteous man. Elisha was a righteous man. Amen? Beloved, King David was a righteous man, even though he zigged when he should have zagged a couple of times there. But he was a righteous man. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Now, the secret of his supernatural strength was his long hair. His long hair signified that the Holy Spirit was both now in him and that the Holy Spirit was now on him, beloved, like he is also in us and on on us today. Would you say amen out there? But you see, Samson fell into gross sin. And when he fell into that gross sin, he broke his Nazarite vow and got his locks cut off and his head shaved, beloved, and he lost this supernatural strength and power. Verse 20, if you look at your text, it says, he wist not, he did not know that the Lord had departed from him then. And when the Holy Spirit left him, his supernatural strength and power was now gone, beloved. Now, listen to me. We as Christians need to pay close attention and heed to this truth, lest we also fall into impenitent sin like he did, beloved, and the supernatural strength and power of God also departs from us. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, King David knew about this. You see, the Bible talked about how The Spirit of God had departed from King Saul. And the Spirit of God departed from Judas. And it departed from Demas. But King David had seen King Saul once filled with the Holy Ghost. But now he fell into sin. And because of that, he took, he, God, took the Spirit of God away from King Saul. And now King Saul was no longer a great warrior. Now, beloved, he didn't want to obey God. Now he did his own thing. And so David prayed in Psalm 51. He says, oh God, in verse 11, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That is, like I saw from my predecessor, King Saul. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Renew a right spirit within me, he says in Psalm 51. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, this grand satanic delusion today is that many backsliders, many lukewarm Christians are thinking that they're still saved that they're still filled with the Holy Spirit and their impenitent sins when they're really not. Now listen to me, the Bible says in Psalms, I mean Isaiah 61.10, that when Israel vexed God, the Holy Spirit departed from them and vexed Israel and became their enemies. Now nothing has changed, though people like to think that that's true, beloved. But backsliders don't understand the danger they're in. Because you can so grieve and quench the voice of the Holy Spirit that he can leave you and you'll be lost. You'll be condemned once again. You'll be hell bound for you which not. No, you didn't know that the Holy Ghost had departed from you. People think because they have an awareness or a mindfulness of the things that they once professed that they're still saved. There's much more to salvation than that. Amen? It's a hot faith we must have. If you don't have obedience to the commandments of God, you do not, you do not have a true saving faith. Come on and say amen out there. So what was Samson's problem? You see, like it is today, really. <laughs> Beloved, Samson's problem was his lust for pagan women. That was his downfall. And Scripture commands both Jews and Gentile uh, Christians that we are not ever to date or marry unsaved people for that very reason. They can lead us astray from the Lord. Amen? You see, beloved, the Bible warns that morally and spiritually loose women, 
slash men can turn a man into a piece of bread. In fact, the Bible says it can make moral and spiritual breadcrumbs out of a man. You know, you kind of crush them up and throw them down. Think about it, beloved. It was Eve that caused Adam to sin. It was Bathsheba that caused David to sin. It was Jezebel that brought Baalism into Israel that caused King Ahab to sin. And here we see that it's Delilah that ended up causing Samson to sin. Amen? You see, folks, in both the Old and the New Testament, now hear me, because someday I won't be here. You know, I'm getting older. I don't know what the Lord has for me, and I don't know who the next preacher is going to be here. But this is something you need to pass on to your children and your grandchildren. Now hear me, I've taught you before that Christianity is one uh, beggar telling another beggar where to find bread, the bread of life, the bread of the Word of God. Amen? And I've taught you this again and again and again for the last 38 years as your pastor in this church, let alone the other church. But I've taught you again and again, beloved, that the Bible, God forbids His people in the Old Testament and the New Testament from missionary dating and marrying unsaved people. Would you say amen out there? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what part hath he that believeth with an infant? The answer to that is none, none whatsoever. You're dating an unsaved person. His father is the god of this evil world, the devil himself. And so, beloved, that's why when you get married, and then you get saved, and one partner gets saved, the other one is not saved yet. It's so tough for the married partner that's a Christian, isn't it? And my heart goes out. I know I went through that myself, and some of you are going through that today. But this is something you need to pass on as your, God works your family out and gets it together. They don't depart from the Lord. God knows, God knows, God knows. From my lips to his ears, I pray every day that TCM stays after I'm off the scene. That's my great hope. What can we do for you, preacher? Keep supporting TCM. This is one of the few churches where the Word of God still preached. And I don't say that, ladies and gentlemen, to exalt myself. But it's just a fact, of, and it's true when you know it. We couldn't be here if God's supernatural hand hadn't done what he did with everybody who came against us. Everything was against us, beloved. But we still built a church and paid it off in nine and a half years. Amen. And we're still in existence, and I praise God for that. So you see, beloved, so because Samson disobeyed God, he was seduced and deceived by this unsaved pagan hussy and temptress. You see, Delilah was a greedy woman. Delilah was a very cold and conniving and manipulating type of a woman. You see, she loved to scheme. She was devious in her heart, beloved. She was deceitful. She pretended that she loved uh, uh, Samson. She showed all her wares, gave her he shouldn't have gotten, and that because of his lust of his eyes and the lust of his flesh, and we know that passion is stronger than reason, and he ended up with this floozy. <laughs> I'll let, I won't go on that. <laughs> he ended up with this floozy, just like Bathsheba with David, beloved. Think about it. What was Bathsheba doing out in the middle of daytime, naked, bathing on top of your roof, especially knowing that the king's porch is right across from you. You tell me what she was doing. You see, God gave mankind three strong instincts. One was the spiritual instinct. Satan's corrupted that. Number two was the survival instinct, and Satan has corrupted that. And number three, it was a sexual instinct. The man could reproduce after his own kind. And I don't have to tell you how much Satan has corrupted that. Amen? Because God gave Adam the dominion mandate to repopulate the earth. And so it's right that a man be attracted to a woman and a woman be attracted to man. And God didn't make Adam and Steve, I've taught you, or Adam and Eve. He made Adam and Eve. Would you say amen? He made them male and female, made he them both the Bible says. 
So I don't go for this identity. I identify as this. I identify as that. The fact of the matter is, you're either biologically a man or you're biologically a woman. End of story on my side. And I think I can prove that to you, hormonally speaking, DNA, but I won't go there uh, with you with that. That's not my sermon today. I can see this is going to be a two-parter. <laughs> Well, sometimes you get up here and you just start preaching. You know what I'm saying, beloved? But anyways, beloved, Samson, because he was satisfied with fulfilling the lust of the flesh, and because he was satisfied fulfilling the lust of the eyes, and Delilah was a beautiful, a beautiful woman with a beautiful figure, this guy melted like a piece of ice, right in the sunshine. Lost his thinking, lost his reasoning, lost his convictions. Because of Delilah, beloved. You see, he lusted. The Bible says after many pagan women, it wasn't just Delilah, she was the capstone. The Bible says that he regularly partied and drank strong drink and wine with the devil's crowd. We see him going to parties all the time, drinking them down. <laughs> you know, Hello, mate, I'll have a point with you, you know, governor. <laughs> right. I mean, this guy just says, I'm going to do what I want to do. I got the power of God on me, and I can do whatever it is I need to do. And nobody can stop me. Would you say amen out there? And then, beloved, the Bible says he ate fermented foods. Like wild honey, beloved, that he got out of the carcass of a dead lion. Remember, he had killed this dead lion. And when he killed the dead lion, he went into Philistia. And of course, the carcass rotted, and the bees came, and they, put a, uh, they had a little nest inside of the lion's mouth, and then they started having some honeycomb. So Samson comes by, sees the dead lion, he says, you know what, I'm a little hungry. Scoops it up, puts it in his mouth, but that was fermented food. That was fermented food. He defiled himself, and then he didn't tell his parents what he did. And he gave them the honey and therefore now here's this holy and righteous man in Israel his parents and he defiles them because he lied to them you see beloved he was quite a guy Samson also killed and he touched the dead cor corpses and carcasses of both men and beasts and he wasn't supposed to do that and now here beloved he also gets deceived he gets destroyed by this woman named Delilah. Delilah, the temptress. Delilah, the seductress. Delilah, the downfall of Samson. Would you say amen? And she got the seven locks of his braided hair cut off, and they didn't stop when they did that. After they cut off his locks, beloved, and gouged out, the, Greek, the Hebrew word means they bored out his eyes. Can you imagine somebody boring out your eyes? And then the Bible says they put lather on his head and they shaved his head. In other words, we're going to make sure no more supernatural strength comes upon you. We looked at that bald head of yours. We know your hair hasn't grown back. We know that the Spirit of God hasn't come back. We know you don't have that supernatural strength that's come back. We've shaved your head. Now, my sermon today is about how you can regrow your hair, okay? Get regrown, whatever, the, what is it? Regain, what's the name of that? Rogain? <laughs> okay. I think you'd be better off getting some road apples and strapping them on top of your head. I don't know. <laughs> Rogain, right? Uh, what is it? Slow in the fill? Anyway, I think you'd be better off that way. But you see, beloved, because this sin was now the last straw in God's sight, because God must have said in heaven, how in the world could you ever do Samson? Knowing that you have violated the last straw of that Nazarite vow that set you apart from everyone. You see, beloved, everyone could recognize him because of his what? His hair. And when his hair was gone, beloved, now they knew he was no longer that man of God. He lost his supernatural anointing. He lost the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. Thus he lost his supernatural strength and power, for he did not know that the Holy Spirit had now departed from him. You see, beloved, ironically at that time, when everyone else was, was doing was right in their own eyes, Samson, because of his sin, Samson, because of his lust, 
Samson, because of his disobedience to God, now followed their sinful example, and consequently he lost his physical eyes, beloved, and his sight, and then ultimately his life. His job was to bring Israel back to the God of Israel. His job was to set the example, like your job and my job is. Culture I've taught you. We talk about culture today. Another sermon I've got coming for you. But we're supposed to be countercultural. We're not supposed to bring the world into the church. We're to bring Christ into the world. And yet it's just the opposite today because what we have is neo-evangelical Christians, social gospel, to think all they're supposed to do is go out and feed people. They don't want to preach the truth because they're afraid they'll have their feet put in the fire and they don't like confrontation. But God didn't say, go ye therefore and feed the world, did he? No, I'm not against feeding poor people. What did God say? Go ye therefore and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. That's the commission of the church. Well, people say, well, it's much easier if I just feed them, but they're still afraid to preach them. Or if they preach, they preach a truncated gospel. Listen to me. Do you have an empty life right now? Have you ever seen uh, Franklin Graham? Do you have an empty life right now? Wouldn't you like things to be better in your life? Then you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know what Pastor Joel would say? Listen, folks out there. Do you want to split hell wide open? No, you don't? Well, our problem is sin. See, that's the gospel. The, it's good news. A1 galleon is the Greek word. There's good news because there's what? Bad news. What's the bad news? Well, I'll tell you what the bad news is. That every person is born physically alive and spiritually dead, and they're cut off from the life of God, and they're going to split hell wide open if they die. And our job is to try to make sure that it doesn't happen. To preach the gospel. And that's why Satan tries to afflict us and he hits your body and he hits your everything, uh, beloved. You see, it's easy to do the other stuff, isn't it? It's like giving money. It's easy to give money. It's hard to give you time. I can give money in a heartbeat. But when people say, pass this, pass that, pass this, and they got your foot and you got your arm and you got your this, whatever, that's hard to give. Especially if you've been talking and preaching and teaching all day and then they say, Pastor, you got a minute? <laughs> and now a lady you're like this. <laughs> Pastor, you got a minute? Yeah. That minute's that long, isn't it? You see, beloved, Samson lost his life, his eyes, his sight. Yet it took this painful experience for him to now gain his spiritual sight. In fact, that's what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul. Saul, King Saul, I mean Pharisee Saul, religious man, lost as a dog in the woods, wasn't he? But on the road to Damascus, he started gaining his spiritual eyesight. And beloved, you listen to me, the more you grow as a Christian, the more you start seeing even clearer and clearer and clearer. I've been saved a lot of years, and the more I read my Bible, the more I pray to God, the more I see my shortcomings, the more I see my failings, the more I see the perfections of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about you? And so a lot of people think that you get saved, that's it. No, beloved, you should be a lot holier now than you were then when you got saved. A lot closer to God now than you went when you first got saved. As we're going on, the Bible says go on unto perfection, not go on to uh, mediocrity. We're to go on under perfection. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, sin has a high cost to it, doesn't it? You hear me now, beloved. When Samson lost his supernatural strength and power, first, the Philistine shaved his head and gouged out his eyes and blinded him. Secondly, they bound him with fetters of brass. And thirdly, they brought him to a prison house chained, and chained him to a spoke on a grain grinding wheel where the now bald and sightless Samson daily and robotically went around and around and around and around and around day and night, all day long, around and around and around and around, pushing the spoke of that grain grinding turnstile. You tell me sin doesn't cost a lot, beloved. Just for cutting your hair? 
just for eating on the forbidden fruit? No, for disobeying God, amen, when he tells you exactly what to do. And so, you can just see Samson, beloved. Look at Samson. I want you to see his bald head right now and the ugly scars on his eyes from his missing eyes, the sockets that are kind of healed over right now. They probably cauterized them with a hot iron to seal them up on his eyes. And beloved, I want you to see the beads of sweat dripping off his bow as he tries to wipe them with the hard and calloused hands that he has as he's been tediously laboring, pushing that turnstile around, around and around and around, beloved. You know, beloved, listen to me. Sin always does three things to us. Now, you ought to write these down. Sin always does three things to us. Number one, sin blinds you. What does it do? Say it again. What does sin do? Sin blinds you. Number two, beloved, hear me now. Sin grinds you. We're looking at Samson, aren't we? Sin blinds you. Sin grinds you. And number three, and sin binds you. Did you hear me? Sin blinds you, grinds you, and binds you. Beloved, as your pastor, I have seen it again and again and again over the years. I've talked to parents, and they think what these kids are doing is cute right now because they're little, and then when they get to be teenagers and rebel, then all of a sudden it causes them all kinds of problems. And guess where they drop? Right at the pastor's desk. And the pastor has to go to the courthouse and has to go to the jail to visit them. And the pastor has to try to get them out of the hospital, whatever it may be. Because what was cute is not cute anymore, is it? Because all these years, that's why the Roman Catholic Church, they understood this. They said, give us a child for the first seven years, we'll make him a Roman Catholic for life. These are the most vulnerable years where you learn, amen? And these morals and these principles and these values are stamped in your heart and in your mind. And that's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, that when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Train them up. But you say, well, I've taught them. The Bible doesn't say teach them. The Bible says train them. My son has a black belt. How's that? Colby, one, one, two, daddy. One, two, one, two. Block, parry, block, parry. Do it, Colby. Do it. Let me see you do it again. Daddy's going to punch. One, one, block, punch. What am I doing? Am I teaching or training? Training. The word training means to chew the cud. You ever see a cow? A cow has two stomachs. A cow grazes. And then he does it again. He chews the what? Chewing the cud. Training means to chew the cud. You're not going to learn it one time. You're not going to teach your son one time. You're not going to teach your daughter one time. Nikki knew how to cook hot dogs perfectly for the... But now, no, she made me some linguista rolls for Pastor Appreciation Month. And by the way, I want to thank all But Nikki, we, Mommy and Daddy ate them all. It's amazing when people give me things for Pastor Appreciation Month and it's food. Elliot partakes of it. <laughs> I said, hey, woman, who gave you permission? <laughs> but there we are. But see, beloved, you, that's why these formidable years you've got to spend time teaching training them. I was always poignantly aware that someday my son would be a father. Someday my daughter would be a mother, a wife, and my son would be a husband. So you train them and you train them and train them because someday you're going to have to loose the tether and let them go. Amen? And trust that the things that you taught them. But if you're a hypocrite, if you don't live what you're preaching and teaching, beloved, your kids will see right through it. Remember a hypocrite. Hypocrites means a play actor. He's someone who never intends to be what he pretends to be. Amen? Say amen out there. All right, you bunch of backsliders. Huh? You see, folks, sinful always, I mean, sin always has painful consequences. But if we repent, listen to me now, I want to give you some hope. If we repent, God can still and God will use you again like he ultimately did with Samson. I'm saying this to you, that our God always gives us another chance. Would you say amen out there? That's why I love our God, beloved. He's the God of second chances. 
for those who will repent and forsake their sin and return to him. But oh, how that old saying rings true here. And moms and dads, you need to hear what I'm saying to you. Because your children are going to start, as they reach puberty and they start getting older, and they start getting attracting to the other opposite sex, passion is stronger than reason. And that's why you need to instill into them moral and spiritual values now. Because the Bible says fornication, sexual immorality, ekponias. What does that sound like? Pornography, doesn't it? That's the Greek word, ekpornia. Okay, is a serious sin in God's sight and can damn someone to hell, though people think that shacking up right now is nothing. We just found out, I have a friend of ours, and this person we've led to the Lord. They don't live in this town, by the way. But this person says they love the Lord, and every time they come with me, they always say, this woman always says, Joel, you're always preaching to me. I says, because you're never walking with God. And she's a good person. I love her. In fact, I got a little nickname for her. I won't say it because I'm on TV and she knows who I'm talking about. But we just found out now, and here's this woman was the most moral woman that I know. Her husband had died shacking up with another guy. Now, can you imagine, beloved, she knows better. She says she reads the Bible every morning. She told my wife this just the other day. You can't help but read the Bible and find out you can't be shacking up outside of marriage. Amen? You can't do that. And if you've done it, you need to repent of it and get on with it and teach your children never to do it. Listen, beloved, I'm for welfare, for helping people who can't help themselves. But you know what? When a woman says, I'm going to go out and fool around and get pregnant, and then I want you to pay for my abortion, that's where my morals stop. How about you? Don't go there, Joel. Okay. I won't. I won't go there. But, beloved, it's serious business, and you can see with Samson just how serious it was. Amen? God didn't just dismiss it. And yet we see it on TV, we sort of inundated with this, that, and the other thing, and people just dismiss it. But God has not dismissed it. Because that's a powerful instinct in us, and God made it that way, so we'd be attracted to the opposite sex. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, I want you to listen to me. Don't you ever let persuasive, attractive flattery and sweet talk from anyone Deceive you into falling prey to the devil's diabolical snare and lair of sin. I want you to look at Samson, beloved. The once mighty warrior who's now a blind slave grinding grain. You know, I don't think he'd now say that Delilah's seductive charms were worth him spending the rest of his life in, sound, in sightless bondage and humiliation. How about you? Hey, Samson, was it worth it? Was she worth it to you, Samson? You know what? You lost your eyes. You lost your life. You lost your God. You lost your anointing. Was it worth it, Samson? No, I don't think he'd say it was. What do you think? I don't think he'd say it was. What do you think? For a moment's pleasure, a lifetime, a lifetime of pain. You know, many times over the years I've seen young people go out and then they're doing what they shouldn't do, and then their girlfriend gets pregnant for the rest of their life, beloved. They're born right now under the gun. They can't even take care of themselves, and now they have to take care of a spouse with a baby. I can't even imagine that. Can you? Pastor, I'm going to shoot you. You would have to wait in line to shoot me. And it's a long one. You see, beloved, i got five minutes, and I'll close in five minutes here. I want you to listen carefully to me. I want you to think about Samson, beloved. Imagine this man anointed like no other man has been anointed. The feats of strength that he did, beloved, better than any giant in the Bible. And they had six fingers and six toes. Samson could kill a fierce and rapacious lion with his bare hands. A bear, the Bible says he ripped his mouths apart. The Spirit of God came on him. Ah, ah! He rips them apart. Right? You see that bear kind of about give you a hoo, hoo, and then boom, he goes down. He rips his jaw apart. Down. 
What does it take? What kind of strength? If I saw that, beloved, I'd have fainted. I'd have said, I can't believe that some man could have this kind of power on him like he has. Samson could uproot heavy stone pillars. The Bible says that these heavy stone pillars with iron bars, he picked them up from the ground, put them on his shoulder, took them 17 miles up the top of the hill. And then the Philistines come out and they're looking for their gate. Samson goes, down here, up here. (laughs) And there's their gate. And there's Samson kind of sitting there like this. No big thing. Yanked them right out of the ground. 17 miles. I, I, when I read that, I say, look, Samson, what's wrong with you? Pull them out. Perfect. They would have seen you had plenty of strength. Carry them 17 miles. <laughs> Wouldn't you? You see, Samson, beloved, he could slay 1,000 Philistines. Still, those people, Philistines, with the jawbone of an ass. I want you to picture this. Here's 1,000 Philistines coming after you. You don't have a weapon. Here's a jawbone of an ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gets through, and the Bible says he kills a thousand. Then he says, Lord, I'm thirsty. God says, pick up a jawbone, have a drink. And he didn't, and water came out of it, right? Supernatural, wasn't it? Samson could do all of these things. It's amazing to me as I look at the life of this guy. Samson could catch 300 foxes and tie their tails together as torches and burn their grain fields. Beloved, I can't catch one fox. And I've got one in my yard. He's always around there. Get out of here. He kind of looks at me. 300. And then not only that, he says, I'm going to make you torches today. He takes their tails. Can you see him picking up foxes? Shut up. Ties them together, puts a torch in, he says, go through the cornfields, go through the grain fields, go through the barley field, burn them down. Samson could do all of these mighty and miraculous supernatural things, but he could not, he could not, he could not control the burning embers of lust and passion that was in his heart. He could do all these other mighty things. That's why I say to you, passion stronger than reason. This lust for pagan women, especially Delilah, who turned him into a worthless piece of bread. So alas, beloved, after he grew tired of her constantly and continuously pleading and nagging and badgering, he revealed to her the secret of her strength. Then like a dummy, I mean, and I have to say that, beloved, you know, he finally gave and told him the truth. Have you ever had people tell you something and you say, I promise you I won't say anything? That's why I don't tell you anything about me. Just what I want you to hear. And I'm a great guy, so you'll repeat it. Pastor's a great guy. <laughs> I won't tell anybody, but then you're with a bunch of people and everybody's feeling chummy right now, and you know, you know. <laughs> you won't believe Tom what happened, really. I'm telling you. <laughs> you know what happened to Mary? And, and then you start, you start sharing it, right? You start sharing what you shouldn't be sharing. And here's Samson. The strongest man in the world at that time. He's got a secret in his heart. Nobody knows what it is but him. And then a woman sifts him like wheat. Shakes him right down. Hi, Samson. Ba-boom, ba-boom, (laughs) ba-boom. Hi, Samson. How do you like my hair today? Do I look pretty for you, Samson? This is a new dress. All right, it's the supernatural God that has come upon me because of my hair. Blabbermouth. Blabbermouth. You should have shut up, amen? No woman, no man, no thing is worth you losing the presence and the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost in your life. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, so alas, after he grew tired and he did that, what does he do? He says, my strength comes from my Nazarite vow. You see, when I I was young, 
I pledged myself to God and had seven braids made in my hair, proving that I'm a man of God, and how I proved it was the Holy Spirit of the living God who's omnipotent comes upon me and gives me power to do anything I want. That's how I know. That's the secret of my strength. Really, Samson? You're not joshing me this time, are you? Oh, no. I'm giving you my whole heart right now. Yeah, and gave him his whole life too. Amen. The Bible says a man can be sifted like a piece of bread. Imagine that, beloved. Because of a woman. (laughs) I told you, when God created Adam, he says, it's not right that man should be alone. I'm going to make you help me. So he laid Adam down, took a part of his fifth rib, took it out. He woke up, and he said, whoa, man, (laughs) whoa, man, you're beautiful. (laughs) But, you know, they were surrounded with a glory cloud, so they couldn't really, couldn't see that they were naked with each other. Well, beloved, I'm going to pick up on this next week. Suffice it to say, when Samson told Delilah what he shouldn't have said to her, about the divine source and secret of his great and mighty strength, beloved, this was the beginning of the end for Samson. I told you that sin blinds you. <clears throat> Honestly, in my life, when something, an important decision has to be made, I sit down with the Lord. And I've taught you before that I take a piece of paper, I put pros and cons, and I just start contrast. I say, Father, show me all the good things that can happen. And I start writing them down. Then I say, show me the cons. Father, let me look down the corridors of time and foresee any problems in the future that may come back and bite me or hurt this church. Give me that foresight, Lord. You promised that you're going to do that. Some people are just so blinded, they see, my dad just says, no, they get it Joel, and it isn't. It can be fool's gold, pirates. Looks like gold, but it isn't worth a penny. Right? So I told you, sin blinds you. And then sin binds you, you become enslaved to it. It becomes your master, instead of Jesus being your master. And then slowly but surely, as with Samson, sin grinds you. It grinds you down, 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 farther and farther and farther away from God. Amen? I said sin does what, number one? Blinds you. Number two, it does what? Begins with a B. The third one begins with a G. It grinds you. It blinds you. It binds you. It. And on that note, I'm going to close. Well, I got you repeating the right things. Beloved, as I look at the life of Samson, I think about what Jesus said. Jesus says, to whom much is given, much should be required. Amen? Imagine being given all that. Beloved, just, just like with David, remember when David, the Bible says that David was able to kill a bear too and a, and a lion? You know, you know that this is your God that you've worshipped, that he's manifested himself so you can see it. I pray that that happens here all the time. Lord, manifest yourself. In fact, there's somebody in this church that I pray for all the time. I pray that when they come back to church, that God in the middle of the service would talk to me and say, Joel, I'm healing this person right now. Have her stand up and it would bring glory to him and revival to us. Because Paul said the kingdom of God is not just words, it's what? Power in the Holy Ghost. Will you say amen? Samson and Delilah. Come back next week and I'll give you the second part. Let's go to the throne of